Chapter 4 XYY No sooner had Requiem strode buoyantly out of the black alleyway than he stopped and slumped. Remembering that Uracil's sneeze had brought the Red Pagoda crashing down, he turned tentatively to look at the north gate. To his relief, Gio was standing proudly with his legs astride, fists on his hips, gazing up at the restored edifice, its full majesty bringing a satisfied smile to his face. Looking at it now, no one would ever have believed that a short time ago the gateway had been little more than shards of wood and slime. Requiem opened his mouth to congratulate Gio on his handiwork, but something caught his eye. Something uncivilised. Uracil's nasal excretions had been gathered into a large rippling ball of mucus which now floated offensively close to the east point of the compass. Requiem tried to keep his cool by focusing on how someone so small, indeed anyone at all, could produce so much mucus. But his attempt at emotional detachment was soon shunted off track altogether. Within the rippling offence, a distorted but typical country scene of vivid blue sky, fluffy white clouds and beaming sun over fields of green could be seen as if reflected in a disturbed pond. The flock of seagulls that Eurasil had been haplessly chasing around the marble courtyard was now flying in the bright blue sky, adding life to the picturesque scene. Without warning, the mischievous flock broke off from its meandering flight and dove straight for the marble courtyard. As the birds tried to push through into the courtyard, the mucus stretched, but, try as they might, they could not force the mucus bubble to yield, and the twenty or so shimmering beaks soon ran out of strength and pinged back into the countryside. Confronted with such utter mayhem, it took all of the self-control Requiem could muster not to implode Uracil on the spot. Aha! Uracil cried triumphantly at the sight of his feather tormentor's comeuppance. You see, my dear, I knew that rubberizing conversion would work. Did you see those bird brains? It's a one-way street from here on in. Rubbing his hands together eagerly, Uracil glanced round the courtyard and added, Now, do you have a cow? Gazing on in a state of pure confusion, Requiem struggled to comprehend it all. Should he congratulate Uracil on rubberizing his mucus to keep unwanted visitors out? Or implode him for not using a hanky? And what was this talk of a cow? Requiem decided that his best bet was to stay calm, focus on the beautiful country scene and breathe. Of course, the sight of Freya and Uracil trying to push a large cow through the mucus portal somewhat dampened the tranquillity of the scene. Unable to stay silent any longer, Requiem turned to Gio. Uracil's nasal excretions are producing cows now? Yup, laughed Gio heartily, who had been watching the whole debacle for some time. Thumping big ones too. You should have seen the pigs. Pigs? inquired Requiem in a weary tone as he looked back at the shimmering mucus. Clearly highly amused by the whole affair, Gio explained cheerily. Well, Uracil's portal only led to Old MacDonald's farm, didn't it? It was the funniest sight to see a field mouse pop out from the portal fragment on poor Greg's arm, I can tell you, scurrying over him, making him scream like a little girl as he beat himself to get it off. It occurred to Requiem that perhaps Erebus was right, the Hafuna would indeed make short work of them. After all, Akatsuki was supposed to be able to turn matter into energy and then back into whatever they wanted at will. Before the days of science and the understanding this brought, it was called magic. Now, the Akatsuki simply called it conversion. Compared to the Hafuna, they were supposed to be supremely powerful yet most of the Akatsuki of the Four Gates had barely mastered the basics of their potential. So perhaps finding Uracil and Freya trying to fit a large cow through a small portal was not so hard to believe after all. It would take a Hafuna child only a few minutes to gauge that a square peg could not pass through a round hole and then they'd move on. This would appear to be a lesson that Freya and Uracil had yet to learn. 
Right. I've had enough of being ladylike, declared Freya as she pushed herself back off the steadfast herbivore. Shooting lightning from her hand, Freya engulfed the cow in a blaze of energy and lifted it off the ground. The cow floated, electrified yet calm, still chewing the cud. Without a thought for anyone in the vicinity, Freya flung the cow back towards the west gate. Geo stepped back to avoid the cow's flailing legs and, wary of Requiem receiving an udder slap in the face, eased him back at the same time. Oblivious to the flailing feet and flying udders, Freya proceeded to shoot lightning around the rippling globular portal with her other hand, stretching it with electric fingers before snapping her hand back and launching the cow. A fair distance from the portal and high in the air, she let the cow go, forcing it into a rapid freefall spin towards the country scene. Distressed, Eurasil ran towards the portal yelling, No! and created a wind that guided the spinning cow down to a gentle landing in the fresh green pastures. Oh, don't be such a sap, Eurasil, said Freya dismissively. The thing's full of gas anyway. It would have landed softly. Keo was rooted to the spot, the side of his face bearing a red, udder-shaped mark. Requiem looked at the shock in Keo's eyes as he slowly moved Keo's hand off his chest. In some disbelief at all he had just witnessed, Requiem turned to Freya. So why didn't you do that in the first place? You nearly lost your hand up that thing. Well, I always wanted to be a vet, replied Freya dismissively, and that was the end of the subject. Wiping his nose with his hanky, Eurasil turned his attention to Requiem. You're looking serious? I hope it's nothing serious. You can't follow Freya's first foray into vet rage with something serious, you know. Placing his hands in his pockets and glancing up at the ivory tower floating high above the marble courtyard, Requiem replied, Nothing serious. Just going to tea and thought you might like to come along. For Keo, the fact that the man who had been imploding the world a short while ago now wanted to go for afternoon tea was enough to pull him out of his udder slap stupor. Oh, 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 tea! Good idea. Let's go. Your place, shall we? Your finest china, I hope. I'll bring the cupcakes. Keo's voice finished so high with mock excitement that he had to stand on tiptoes to reach it. Still looking aloft, Requiem replied calmly, determined not to rise to the bait. No, Talis's place. Hmm, Talis, swooned Freya. A world-famous Baroque composer. I'm sure we'll find some elegance there. Suddenly, a look of uncertainty crossed her face. Wait a minute. He's been dead for quite some time, hasn't he? Requiem knew Freya had a weakness for any rock that sparkled or metal that gleamed and, sensing her hesitation, replied, Yep, but this talis still has a vast estate and is extremely rich. Great, sign me in snivels up, exclaimed Freya, eagerness renewed and redoubled as she grabbed Eurasil. She turned to Keo. You coming, sarcasm boy? And Miss Girl Power trying to act all refined around the rich? Ha, <laughs> not on your life. Let's go. Requiem looked back at them and smiled. Good, he said cheerily. I'm glad you're all so eager. Turning to Eurasil, he continued with the same cheer and enthusiasm. Can you sneeze us to Mongolia, or am I going to have to use a monolith? Few people of the four gates could produce portals or teleport. If they wanted to traverse the globe, most would go down an alleyway to one of the satellite towns or cities attached to the four gates, which was hidden in or near the country they wanted to visit, and then use more conventional transport. Requiem and Eurasil were among the few who could travel faster, but they used very different methods. Eurasil could barely control his mode of teleportation. Every time he sneezed, he would open a portal. Sometimes these portals were too small to use. Sometimes, like earlier, the portal would scatter and need to be collected. Either way, it rarely went where Eurasil intended, if indeed he intended it at all. 
However, his portals were destined for greatness. Now and again, the Akatsuki would get a glimpse of this as Urasaur produced a beautiful beaming portal to what looked like another world. Oddly, Urasil could only ever produce portals within the four gates. If one of them remained open in another part of the world, he could reuse it. But when it shut itself, he couldn't summon another one. It was very much a one-way trip. Requiem, on the other hand, had no problem calling or controlling his portal. The challenge was the violence that the traveller inside was subjected to. Requiem's monolith appeared to have a life of its own and jerked erratically throughout the journey. Requiem was of course unaffected, and Keo, with all his bulk, could just about withstand the pressures. Most other people, however, were in for a very rough ride, especially if, as in Eurosil's case, the monolith took a disliking to you. The mere thought of riding the monolith turned Eurosil pale. There's no way I'm getting in that thing again. Last time it tried to leave my arms in Albania. I can't help who it likes now, can I? You shouldn't have sneezed over it, declared Requiem, waving his arms in defiance and causing Eurosil to shrink towards Freya. Uh, excuse me, said Keo in feigned politeness. Excuse me. Everyone turned. Requiem cupped his hands behind his back, pretending to look attentive whilst he surreptitiously generated some dust. Now that Keo had everyone's attention, he continued his attempt to point out the obvious. Mongolia? Yes, thank you for reaffirming the destination in Eurasil's mind. Without further ado, Requiem flung the dust into Eurasil's face, causing him to sneeze all over them with an earth-shattering boom. Everyone except Eurasil was instantly covered in portals to Mongolia and began to get sucked into their destination. When all that remained of Freya was a glistening puddle of mucus floating in the air, a lace-draped hand shot out and grabbed a startled Eurasil, who, in turn, was squeezed awkwardly into the hole and off to Mongolia. The winds howled and the shards of ice they carried tore into the mountain top. Amidst these chaotic currents, a beaming crack appeared and then slowly dripped. As the drips trailed down an invisible wall, the crack widened and Requiem emerged, brushing the last of the mucus from his suit jacket. Keo followed close behind, rubbing his bare biceps in the biting cold. It wasn't long before Freya appeared, dragging a slightly squashed Eurosaur behind her and depositing him in the snow the instant the cold hit in order to adjust her clothes. Calmly, Requiem walked over to Eurosil, picked him out of the snow, stood him upright and slapped him. This is Snowdonia. The only way this is remotely the same as Mongolia is the cold and the ear. Now, get back into the portal and redirect it before it drips away completely. Not daring to utter a word, Freya and Keo followed as Requiem pulled Eurosil by the arm through the dripping hole in the air only to reappear in Montrose, Scotland. Seriously? whimpered Requiem. Look, he said more forcibly, his frustration rising. We don't want a tour of the UK. Take us to Asia. Attach the Mon to the ear. Put a goal in the middle and we're there. Everyone back into the hole. Eurasil knew all too well what was coming and shot into his dripping portal before Requiem could reach him. Geo and Freya slunk in next, bravely acting as a buffer between Requiem and Eurasil. Moments later, the light of the portal appeared before them for a third time and a cold, bracing wind hit their faces. Everyone winced, but no one more so than a now highly fearful Eurasil. Stepping into the light, they found themselves standing in a nondescript land that was devoid of trees, plants, soil and structures. Everything, it would seem, apart from snow and rocks. Eurasil nervously darted about, looking for anything that would prove they were in Mongolia, while Requiem stood in the biting wind, attempting to cool his temper. Freya and Keo joined Eurasil's hunt, keen to ensure that Requiem didn't do anything rash. The signs weren't good, but 
Just as they were trying to ascertain whether Uracil's nasal exhalations had finally done their job, the portal melted shut. I smell, stated Gio, pouncing on the one thing he could identify to save Uracil's bacon. I've been telling you that for ages, cut in Freya before Gio could finish. Predictable, retorted Gio dismissively. As I was saying, I smell food. That means people, at the very least, so maybe we can figure out where we are. Let's follow your nose then, shall we? It can't cause us any more problems than Uracil's, said Requiem as he threw Uracil a cutting glare. Some time later, and still with no civilization in sight, Freya leaned close to Requiem and whispered, Has Keo got a cold? How do we know he hasn't lost the scent and is too stubborn to admit it? He could be aimlessly leading us around in this white void for hours. Leaning his head towards Freya, Requiem said with a drawl, Shocking, don't you think? Requiem winked. Freya smiled, and Uracil, who was following just behind, looked confused. Freya needed no more prompting. Spreading her fingers wide, she pulled her arm back. Uracil peered at her dainty palm as it crackled and sparked with energy in front of him. Tearing her gaze from her hand, Freya beamed a brilliant smile back at Gio, who had looked around to see what the chattering was about. Freya's smile was so warm and friendly, so innocent and touching, it concealed her mischievous intent perfectly as Gio turned back to continue his search. Ow! <coughs> coughed Requiem. Uracil flapped his arms, frantically trying to get Gio's attention as understanding dawned. But Requiem had momentarily constricted Uracil's airways, literally stealing his breath. It was a silent act he had needlessly concealed with a cough, but that was Requiem's style. He was often light-hearted with his torment. Freya thrust a hand forwards, shooting the lightning into the snow. A glowing white line traced a jagged path beneath Gio's feet. Gio's hair stood on end with static before he could even comprehend what was happening. Freya's lightning scythe shot up out of the snow engulfing Gio entirely and thrust him high into the air. "'How's the view?' called Freya as Gio nervously intoned. "'I am zen. I am zen.' Starting to get irritated, Freya rattled Gio's cage and shouted, "'Come on, you big girl! We haven't got all day. What do you see?' Grabbing hold of the bars of his electric prison for stability, Gio yelled, "'My lunch!' only to get a shock so intense he shuddered manically. Any preconceptions his stomach had of jettisoning its load were put on hold as lunch was shaken back down into place. Requiem laughed. Gear was such a black hole when it came to food that being sick was a physical impossibility. But Requiem played along. Well, if you find where that smell is coming from, we can replace it with a new one. This appeared to stir something in Gio, who opened his eyes. Pointing through the bars with an outstretched arm, he called out, That way! before being sent into a tingling frenzy once more. The troop followed in the direction of Gio's arm, with Freya keeping him suspended aloft in his electric crow's nest. Every now and again, Gio would shout, Left! or Right! guiding them towards salvation. Intermittently, he would also shout random words like lettuce or Milan, either because he was hungry and wanted to be in warmer climes or because the height, cold and jolts were sending him slowly crazy. Whatever the reason, they didn't have long to worry as they soon saw lights peering through the thick, snow-laden horizon. 